Once again, good morning, church. I expect that uh, most of you here today, especially the parents and grandparents, enjoyed the little parade the kids did for us with Pastor Jacob and some of the children's ministry team earlier in the service. It's hard not to smile at kids who are doing cute well. But the scene that they were sort of reenacting, the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem six days before his death, was not a cute scene from a children's story. It was one of the most dramatic and significant events in the life and ministry of Jesus, one that has become synonymous with the opening of the most important week in the church's calendar. But like the majority of significant events in history, many of the people who were there in Jerusalem that fateful day were completely oblivious to what was going on right around them. Thankfully, our our passage today from Matthew's Gospel puts the matter right before us in three pointed and pregnant scenes, which I would like to examine with you so that we can understand the significance of what happened that Sunday when Jesus entered Jerusalem. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open to Matthew 21, 17 to 34. And if you don't have a Bible or don't have it with you, you can find one in the pew rack there in front of you. Let's go back just a bit before the opening of the first scene. Preceding this event, Jesus has privately affirmed to the disciples that he was the Messiah, but he spent a great deal of time and effort to teach them what that meant. As we saw last week, the disciples had a very hard time overcoming their presuppositions about the Messiah and about his kingdom. So Jesus had to keep explaining and demonstrating what kind of a Messiah he was and what his kingdom is like. But despite all of his efforts, the disciples are still caught up in the excitement of their anticipation that Jesus is about to reveal himself as the deliverer of Israel. And let's also go back to what we learned about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Recall that before Jesus began going around in Galilee, he actually started ministering in Judea. In addition to that, Jesus has made several trips to Jerusalem during his years of ministry, usually in connection with one of the annual feasts, such as Passover. And people have come to hear him from all over the land, including Jerusalem. And as a result, he has disciples who are living in Jerusalem or in the nearby villages, such as Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. And that explains how Jesus can send two of his disciples into the village to secure a mount on which he can enter Jerusalem. It would appear that he'd made prior arrangements to use the donkey and her foal with someone in the village who was either a disciple or a sympathizer, someone who was sympathetic to Jesus. And he'd even arranged for a coded message that could be used to confirm matters when it was time, since the person in the village might not know who the disciples were that Jesus sent. Let's turn now to that opening scene. Jesus' entrance to Jerusalem on a donkey. That was a deliberate action on Jesus' part, a carefully planned move taken consciously and purposefully in order to fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah 62.11 and Zechariah 9.9. Isaiah 62.11 says this, The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to daughter Zion, See, your Savior comes. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. Now, Isaiah was prophesying in the 8th century B.C., approximately 150 years before Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians and Israel was sent into exile. And the oracle here in chapter 62 predicts the return of the exiles from captivity and the restoration of the city. And then comes this promise to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You see, in the Hebrew scriptures, cities are regularly personified as females, just as it's done here, daughter Zion. Their savior, the promised deliverer would come to them, come to Jerusalem, bringing the reward of his salvation. Two centuries later, after Isaiah has prophesied these words, Zechariah comes and he gave this word of God to the exiles who had by that time returned from Babylon and were now living in Judea, waiting for the temple to be rebuilt, waiting for the city of Jerusalem to be restored. And in chapter 9, verse 9, Zechariah says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The remnant of Israels who, the, I'm sorry, the remnant of Israelites who returned from exile 
were living in the land, but they were a subject people ruled by the Persians, waiting for the promised son of David who would deliver them from their oppressors. And Zechariah's prophecy reaffirms what Isaiah said, that this son of David would come to the city bringing salvation. And what Zechariah adds is this crucial detail about how the king would come into the city, riding on a donkey, a sign that he was coming in peace to be welcomed and acclaimed rather than a king who is coming to conquer. And by the way, there's no contradiction or confusion in Matthew's account when he mentions that the disciples were to bring both the colt and its mother. The other gospels only mention the colt on which Jesus sat, but not the mother. Zechariah's prophecy is given in typical Hebrew poetic style. And so the colt is described with several different expressions. There's only one colt. And his words don't require a second animal on which the king would sit. It does mention the foal of a, of a donkey, a female donkey. Well, why then would they bring the mother along with the colt as well? It's actually pretty simple. This colt had never been ridden. It would be easier for this young colt to handle the stress of being ridden for the first time in a crowd of people if its mother were close by, leading the way. And so they brought the mother as well. More than four centuries after Zechariah's prophecy, the Jews are still living in the land. Now they have a rebuilt temple, but they are still a conquered and subject people, ruled now by the Romans, and they are still waiting for a king, for the son of David to save them. Jerusalem swelled to more than three times its usual size as pilgrims filled the city to celebrate the Passover feast, this annual commemoration of God's deliverance of his people from bondage in Egypt. And it was precisely at this moment that Jesus chose to enter the city with a throng of his disciples who are boisterously praising God for all of the miracles they had seen. They were giddy with excitement. Their expectation that God's promised king was about to show himself could not have been any higher. And the disciples cry out with a chant of praise that rings with these echoes of scripture. They call out, Hosanna! That's an expression of praise that means, save us, please. And they openly address their praise to the son of David. They are loudly announcing to the crowds in Jerusalem that the Messiah has arrived. He's coming to Jerusalem. Now, fortunately for the disciples and for Jesus, there are so many of them in this crowd and there are so many other pilgrims crowding their way into the city that the Roman soldiers are focused entirely on crowd control and not paying any attention to the chants. And it helps a little that this other chant of praise, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is one that's already on the lips of many other pilgrims. Because most of the people are simply repeating this traditional prayer of blessing and praise with reference to one another. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as a way of greeting one another, as a way of welcoming fellow Israelite travelers to the holy city for the festival that's going to follow. But the disciples are using this traditional prayer of blessing and praise to say that the blessed one, the Messiah, has come. And they are eager to spread the word that their king has come to his capital to establish his throne and inaugurate the promised kingdom of God. Now, our little parade this morning really doesn't come close to picturing what was happening in Jerusalem that Sunday morning. You have to imagine that the scene would have been more like Massachusetts Street after a KU championship victory. Most of the people in those crowded streets in Jerusalem had little or no idea what was going on with the disciples. To all of those thousands of travelers, there's probably about 100,000 travelers from elsewhere, plus 50,000 or so who lived in the city. They would all have been busy trying to find their relatives, looking for lodging, buying provisions, making preparations for the feast, taking their animals to the temple to be inspected to see if they could be sacrificed. But Jesus' entrance was dramatic enough and loud enough that people could tell that something was going on, something out of the ordinary. And the disciples' action of placing their cloaks and their branches on the road 
clearly signaled that this was a special procession for a dignitary of some kind. Though who it could be was kind of unclear. So those who were close enough to the route taken by the disciples and Jesus, well, they were interested. Their interest peaked a little bit. Who is this? Well, the reply comes from the crowds of followers. Interestingly, from the crowds, not from the twelve. And they answer in the only category that makes sense to them. Well, well this, is, this is the prophet, Jesus. He's from Galilee. He's from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, some of those who had traveled to Jerusalem, some of those who had lived in the city, would have been familiar with this name, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus' fame had spread throughout the land, so many would have at least heard stories about him. Some would have had the opportunity to hear him for themselves. Some might even know someone who'd been healed by Jesus. And it isn't long before word spreads through the city and crowds of people begin to seek him out, to look for him. But before those crowds arrive, Jesus stages a little scene of his own, the second scene in this passage. Verse 12 and 13 describe this in very simple language, but it must have been a most dramatic and unforgettable event. In the outermost court of the temple, which is as far as Gentile God-fearers were allowed to go, the atmosphere was not one of prayer and worship, but the clamor of the marketplace. There were priests there who were busy inspecting animals brought for sacrifice, many of which would be discovered to have flaws that prevented them from being used. And so the people who had brought them would not be able to sacrifice their animal. And those whose animals were rejected would have to buy an animal from one of the approved sellers of animals who were nearby at the tables there in the court. And with all of the crowds needing animals for sacrifice, well, supply and demand, the prices would be high. And because these sacrifices were to be made in the temple, the holy place of God's dwelling, well, payment for those animals would have to be made with Jewish currency, special temple coins, not with unholy pagan money. So travelers would first have to exchange their foreign currency for special temple coins. And as anyone who has ever traveled knows well, there's always a fee or three for the transaction. The city was inundated with tens of thousands of pilgrims. And that meant that business in the temple court was good. The lines were long and the money was flowing. Now, Jesus' entrance into the city had come with a symbolic sign. He rode in on a humble donkey, signifying his peaceful intentions. But humility and weakness are not the same thing. When Jesus reached the temple, meekness was not the appropriate response. Jesus was enraged, he was furious. This was his father's house and his own house as well. Not in my house is the message he had to give. This holy place that God had designed to be a place where the nations could come to meet with God had become a glorified bazaar, noisy, boisterous, rife with corruption, more concerned about commercial profit than the prophetic word. And so Jesus charged those merchants and money changers like a warrior in full battle mode. And he tore through their booths and tables and he drove them out of the temple courts. Now putting a stop to a successful money-making enterprise is a sure way to get attention and to galvanize your enemies. And with this action, Jesus was asserting his authority over the temple as the son of God and the son of David. He was saying, I and I alone have the right to say what happens in God's house because this is my house. And he was making a very sharp and fierce critique of the priesthood and the worship in the temple, in his house. And that critique was well noted, if not heeded. See, he is critiquing, criticizing The corruption of the temple worship, which had been subordinated to commercial interests, instead of making a way for people to approach God, especially these Gentiles, they had erected new barriers that made it harder to worship. Can you imagine trying to pray in a bazaar? He was also criticizing the corruption of the priests, 
who were stealing from the people and enriching themselves in the name of God through their control of those commercial practices. I think this is a good reminder for us. Not the main point of the sermon, still a good reminder. We want to be very careful that we are not putting unnecessary barriers in front of people who need to meet Jesus. That we're not making it harder for them to come to Christ. The gospel itself and the cross will always make people stumble and turn away. They'll say, nope, I don't want that. And we can't change that, and we should never shrink away from that. People will be offended at Jesus, at his exclusivity, at the gospel, at the cross. Can't change that. People will be offended by the demands that Jesus makes on those who follow him. We want to make sure that we're not adding other obstacles that are matters of personal preference or cultural traditions or habits. And we never want to forget that our focus as a church should be on making it possible for people to meet Jesus, not making a profit or lining our own pockets. The third scene in this passage follows directly, beginning in verse 14. Because once Jesus has cleared out the temple courts, he sets up shop for himself. And he begins teaching the crowds who have flocked to hear him, and he heals the sick who have come seeking his touch. What's interesting is that Matthew specifically mentions him healing the blind and the lame. Now, it's not just that these would be miraculous kinds of healings. That's certainly true, and that's something that Matthew is very careful to point out. But there's another reason why he tells us that Jesus healed the blind and the lame in the temple courts in Jerusalem. You see, in 2 Samuel 5, a thousand years earlier, David has ended the civil war with Saul's house and has united the Israelites under his rule. And he decides that he wants to make Jerusalem his capital city. But Jerusalem is held by the Jebusites. And its location and the terrain make it nearly impregnable. And so the Jebusites mock David. They taunt him. Find this in verses 6 to 8 of chapter 5. And they taunt him. They say the blind and the lame will be adequate to repulse his efforts. But David's men discover that they can get into the city through one of the water shafts that brings water into the city. And so David sends word to his army to return this taunt and to strike the blind and the lame, meaning the Jebusites, David's enemies. And his army is successful. They take the city. Jerusalem becomes his capital. As a result, this phrase, the blind and the lame, becomes a sort of a proverbial way to describe the enemies of King David who are not allowed to enter his city. Well, a thousand years later, the Jewish religious leaders in the first century have extended the Mosaic Law's statements in Leviticus 21. Leviticus 21 gives instructions that says someone who is blind or lame cannot serve as a priest. They cannot come into the temple as a priest. And the Jewish religious leaders now extend this, this exclusion from the presence of God. They extend this to mean that no person who is brought blind or lame, can enter the inner courts of the temple. They're excluded on the grounds that they are defective, like the animals that are rejected for use of sacrifices. They have to remain outside so they don't insult God or stain his holiness. But Jesus, the son of David, the heir to David, overturns this. He turns this upside down and inside out. After cleansing the outer court, the court of the Gentiles, he leads his followers and the crowds into the inner court, the court of Israel, and he begins teaching and healing people. And people begin bringing even the blind and the lame into that restricted place so that Jesus can touch them. And when he does, they're made well again. As the Son of God, whose house this is, he overturns this arbitrary exclusion and invites those who are broken to be made whole. Instead of being forced to stay outside, they're invited to come in and meet with God. Instead of the temple being a place where its holiness must be protected against stain, something that had already been breached by the corruption of the priests, Jesus made it a place where God's holiness could reach out to sinful and broken people and transform them so that they become holy as well. 
This, of course, is shocking and infuriating to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the champions of separation from all that is unclean. For Pharisees, Jesus' actions of welcoming sinners and those who were ceremonially unclean, that was an utter perversion. To them, Jesus clearly showed what they'd assumed all along, that he was a lawbreaker. And his disdain for the law, which they interpreted as requiring them to completely separate from people who were less observant than they were of the observant of the, the oral laws, well, that made him a threat. He was a threat to their program of bringing Israel into conformity with God's law. How could he be the Messiah? When their assumption is, well, the Messiah can't come until Israel is completely obedient to the law. So instead of being thrilled with the demonstration of the love and the power of God that brought healing to people, they were indignant, which is a nice way of saying that they were offended and disgusted and furious. But Jesus was always comfortable with lowly people, with the despised, with the outcasts. He was happy to associate with people whom the upper class and the religious leaders deemed contemptible, the poor, the humble, the weak, the sick, the injured. He gave dignity and welcome to those who were despised, to women, to children. The Pharisees and priests saw those kind of people as suspect. They saw their ailments as evidence that they were cursed by God. Jesus didn't hold to that. He saw them as precious, as beloved by God. Romans, on their part, viewed these kind of people as weak and worthless. Jesus saw them as valuable, wanted by God. And he was happy to welcome them and to teach them, to heal them, and to include them among his followers. But doing so enraged the Pharisees and the priests, especially after his disruption of the temple business and his critique of their practices. And then to add fuel to the fire, there was this other small matter of the children. These children were doing the unthinkable. They were praising Jesus and ascribing to him the title Son of David, that is the Messiah, and they were doing it in the temple, the holiest site in all of Israel. To the Pharisees, this was not only unbecoming and distasteful, it was dangerous, more important, it was blasphemous. How dare they say such a thing? These are children. They don't know what the law means. They haven't studied the rabbis. They don't understand the prophets. They're just children. Who were they to say who the Messiah was or was not? Why had their parents not restrained them? Why had they not beat them? Why had not they kept them quiet at least? And Jesus has not rebuked the children or their parents for their insolence or made his disciples quiet them down. Actions of the children were outrageous, and his inaction was worse. But Jesus' response to their outrage was not only brilliant and instructive, it was deeply profound. But let's not misunderstand him. The Pharisees are condemning the children for their reckless behavior, for their blasphemy. But notice that Jesus does not say to the Pharisees, Oh, get off your high horse. Leave them alone. They're just kids. They're cute. Lighten up. That's not what he says. Because this wasn't a case of grumpy old folks complaining about children being silly or childish. And Jesus wasn't defending them for, well, they're just being kids. Jesus has a much stronger point to make. The Pharisees are accusing these children of being uninformed, making false assertions and baseless claims, claims that could get them all imprisoned by the Romans and possibly killed, and then judged by God for blasphemy. They're being foolish, they're playing games with God's word instead of taking it seriously. They're making serious accusations against these kids. And Jesus not only defends what the children said, he challenges the Pharisees with a devastating counterpunch. Jesus taunts them It says, have you never read? He's he's dripping with sarcasm. Have you never read? He is saying to these who were the experts so-called in the law. Have you never read these words that are straight from the scriptures? Jesus says to the supposed experts, you accuse the children of blasphemy, but they are the ones who are accurately applying the words of Scripture to this situation. They are the ones who rightly understand 
what the scriptures teach. They are doing what it says to do. They are fulfilling the very prophecies they cite. And you are the ones who don't understand God's word at all. You are the ones who are blaspheming. Have you never read? Jesus says not only are those, his, the children's actions words acceptable, they are biblically warranted. They are exactly the right things to do and to say. Now these three scenes set the tone for the whole week that's going to follow. Because Jesus entering into the city, his conflict with the priests and the temple personnel and the Pharisees, his welcome of the crowds, teaching them, healing them, signals that his final week is going to be one that's marked with powerful ministry, strong conflicts with the Jewish religious leadership. His followers are going to continue to proclaim him as the son of David. Some are beginning to wonder, why doesn't he use his power to overthrow the Romans? And the crowds are going to grow. But so is the opposition and the controversy from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus demonstrated that he wasn't going to be the kind of a king that the people were expecting. But he had come to his city. He had come to his house. And he came as the king. He might have come in humility. And he would be humbled further still when his time came. But he boldly asserted his claim to be the rightful king of Israel, did it without shame, certainly not in weakness. What he would not do is to abandon the road that the Father had set for him, for his kingdom was not of this world. It wasn't the same sort of kingdom that the Romans knew or that the Jews expected. It would be a different sort altogether. And establishing that kingdom required a level of humility that had never been seen on the earth, but would be made manifest just outside the city on a Friday, six days later, right before the Sabbath. The time for the coming of the kingdom of heaven was here, and the king had come to his temple, to his house. He was a different kind of king, brought a different kind of kingdom, had a very different kind of inauguration.